Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. It's been a month for those of you that are um, on the online so, or the live editing stuff. So it's been a month since we did our last one, and it's really, uh, it'll be roughly another month um, before we do the next. But hello. Welcome. Um, welcome, Tom. Tom has made it online for the first time ever. There we go. Um, but to everyone that is online, um, welcome in. As normal, for those of you that are used to it, we're going to be spending the next hour editing in that program. So Capture One. Capture One is a raw processor made by the guys in Copenhagen um, at, strangely, the company called Capture One. Um, and a raw processor takes our content that we capture in the camera, allows us to make adjustments, and then hopefully pop out something a bit better or, more importantly, more alike what we actually saw with our eyes, which sometimes the camera can have a habit of sort of fading down or dumbing down. Um, so from that point of view, we're going to be doing that for the next hour. There are a few other things we're going to cover quickly, but for those of you that haven't been online live, please, please make this as interactive as you wish. So if I do something that you don't understand, then just put it in the comments in the live chat. Um, we'll try and cover what we can. Um, but uh, it, other than that, we're just going to run through with your images, not mine. So they're images that you guys have sent in, and we're going to see what we can do with them. Um, so, few things. Not house rules, because we don't really have them. There's no fire exits or anything like that. Um, I'm guessing most of my fellow Brits are currently in the garden or a pub or a pub garden right now, because it's their free day off. It was kind of tempting to broadcast this from a balcony in London, but yeah. Anyway, um, so let's get started in terms of the, uh, the groundwork, as it were. So we're going to start with the version of Capture One that we're using. If you do not have Capture One or have never heard of Capture One, go to CaptureOne.com. Download a free trial. Uh, it's fully operational, works for, I think, 30 days, whether it's 30 days or a month or whatever. Either way, um, completely free of charge, completely unlimited in terms of use and access. Um, there's no watermarking or stupid things like that. You can just use it to your heart's content. Um, have a go with it. You can probably follow along with this video as well um, later on. But if you do have Capture One, please make sure you are on the current version, which is now 15.2.2, getting several point versions in. Um, so it's marketed as Capture One 22, which is for the year 2022. That's going to make sense. But the software version, if you go to About, you'll see up there, um, will actually say 15.2.2. Um, so bear that in mind. That's what you're looking for. Now, a few things. Uh, firstly, this morning, I think, um, most people have got an email saying, ta-da, Capture One for iPad is launching on the 28th of June. Now, it's 1 p.m. Central European Standard Time. Um, although I'm not sure that is the case, because surely it should be Daylight Savings now, because they still do that, but anyway. Um, which is 12 p.m., so noon in the UK, and whatever that works out in your time zone. Now, it's going to be available in the App Store, so it's an Apple App Store um, program downloadable it is a subscription um so a lot of people this morning talking about that i don't think they've ever hidden the fact that it will be a separate subscription in fact i think they've made a big point of it um, but the pricing was announced this morning which is going to be 4.99 a month knowing how apple work out their current um transatlantic exchange rates apparently that equates to four pounds 99 if you're in the uk um now whether that actually does that for capture one i'm not sure but the baseline being four dollars 99 a month it's going to be version one. Now, obviously, with apps, they tend to be updated um, live. So that subscription, in the same way as if you subscribe to Capture One, will keep you updated and keep you on the latest. The same will apply um, for Capture One for iPad. So if you subscribe into version one, when it's 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, um, then you're going to get that included in there. Now, at the moment, um, Capture One for iPad is considered and, and promoted as a companion app for the desktop. So it gives you base edits, it gives you rating, it gives you cloud upload, it gives you the ability for, you know, crop, keystone, um, oh, sorry, crop rotation um, and, and keystone and stuff all in, in that package. Um, but you've just got to bear in mind that things like layers, things like masks, things like tethering aren't in version one yet. So don't download with that expectation. Please take it for what it is in version one and then look at, um, hopefully, the next release and the next release building and building on features um next up then uh so we covered uh last week i think it was last week it feels a long time ago um we did the first of the masterclass session so the night cityscape um session that was on the 24th uh for those of you that were in it great 
um, you're all quite nice and interactive, which is great. Um, and hopefully people learned quite a lot out of it. Um, we've, I've seen, funnily enough, we've got some images been sent in from lots of people with, um, with either a, oh, I wish I knew that before, or a, ooh, this is cool now. Um, so for those of you that haven't um, seen that masterclass or want to, um, look in the description of this video and you'll find a link to be able to do that. And for those of you that don't want the cityscape stuff and want the happy golden hour landscape stuff, that's the next one. So next up, we're going to be doing the golden hour um, landscape. So sunrise, sunset, just before, just after. 21st of June. Strangely, we're doing it in the solstice day. Um, so the, the longest day. There we go. Um, but that'll be at 3 o'clock on, uh, on the 21st. So for those of you that want to, join us on that. Again, in the description, you'll find the link. Oh, almost ran out of breath. <laughs> so um, the final one before we get into editing. Uh, speaking of or oh, speaking of golden hour, uh, for those of you that were on it yesterday, you will have seen that we were on the Capture One channel yesterday live with David Grover. The reason for that is David and I are going on holiday to do a thing. Um, it's not a holiday and it's not a thing. It's a shoot up in Iceland, um, and we're stupid enough to not learn from the Dorset catastrophe and not learn from trying it on a rooftop in London. We're going to try live broadcasting again, um, but this time out in the uh, in the landscape of Iceland. We're going there for midnight sun, so we're not going to broadcast live. Don't worry, you don't have to be up at 1 a.m. in the UK or, or Europe, although that would help in the US and Australia, right? Um, sorry, but no, it'll be um, it'll be at sort of sensible hours for us, <laughs> um, and we're going to spend the week effectively shooting, getting content, some of that content for Capture One to use in future webinars and stuff like that, some of the content for Head Office for those guys, some of the content for you guys, and some of the content for pure fun and broadcasting live from the middle of nowhere, hopefully. So if you want to tune in, that's not on here, so it's not on this channel, it's on that that one, the Capture One Pro channel. So if you go to uh, YouTube and look for that channel, you will find there should be, I think, four lives. We already did one yesterday, so you can catch up with that um, about the planning stuff, but there are four to follow. So join along with that. Um, right, that's it. Announcement's done. Cool. No fire exits, no fire drills planned today. We're all good. Um, Paul, <laughs> I just bought your style pack. I guess I have to shoot color now. Color's great. Black and white is good. Um, and I, I love black a, a good black and white that shows texture and contrast and stuff like that is fantastic. But um, if you're shooting at golden hour and you're shooting at sunrise and sunset, you know, almost the, 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 you, there is a diminishing point, let's put it that way, to shooting in golden hour and then taking all the color away. Um, so yes, Paula, shooting color, it's good. It's good fun. Um, oh, Tony, oh, di well... So Grover and Reefer and I will give me something to, to watch from my hospital bed. Hopefully, it's not going to involve David or me needing to do anything from hospital bed. But good luck. Right. Uh, let's get into Capture One. And first thing, we're going to talk about a rule that I've just broken, which is if you don't give us your name, we're not going to use your picture. Um, and I wish whoever CSP is had given us um, their name. So I don't know um, who this image is. is um, but... The question was about um, getting these colors right in Capture One and doing the, the calibration stuff. Now, I'm not going to do a full round trip calibration here um, because it involves going out to x right software. And strangely, I, I was actually looking at whether we could do it um, and their software just keeps crashing for some reason on, uh, on my computer today. So not sure what's going on there. However, I think there may be a bit of a misconception in terms of how you generate profiles from one of these checkers. So the question that came in was about how we um, how we match uh, the fact that you know this one should be two four four, this one should be one nine two, this one should be whatever one two eight, this one should be I don't know. There are different values, and actually, uh, let me see if I can find it. X right actually provide there we go um, all of the lab or lab values. Um, which we can show up in Capture One. So if I look here at E5, that should be 96 minus 0.6, you know, 2. When I move over here onto E5, I get 95.16, okay. But I don't get the other two values matching, the 1.52 up here and the, what's that, the 0 0.28. It's not the right value for what should come out of the color checker. And that's the whole point. And this is, this is where I, th I think we've just got to be careful here. The point of these color checkers isn't 
so that we go into capture one and we tweak well sorry you can if you want to but so we, we could tweak all of the values in here we could tweak the colors in the color editor in here and we could try and get it to match those values that, that xray have given us but that's not where these things are powerful so the reason that you have one of these color checkers is so that you can create an icc profile that is specific to your camera and your lighting in the scene that you're shooting. And it's why quite often you'll see uh, models and so on holding a color checker or holding a, a gray card or whatever in front of the camera it's so that later on we can make sure that we're matching and balancing color correctly. If ever you want to see an LAB readout at the top of the screen, uh, go to your view menu. You've got lab readout and you can turn it on or off your choice. I'm going to turn it off for now and we'll go back to RGB, which is what we normally use on, on, uh, on digital images. And we're just going to talk about how you get the profile into X-Rite software and the process of doing it. Because this profile is only relevant, and it's just really important this, you can't just profile your camera. You're profiling your camera in a certain lighting condition. So that may be a flash. It may be a flash at a certain distance. It may be LED lights. It may be uh, continual light or continuous lighting. It could be daylight. It could be, and again, think about daylight. It changes throughout the day. So at the start of the shoot, you can create stuff. Um, you can create your ICC profiles so that these colors remain neutral. Now, if you don't want the colors to remain neutral, if you're shooting in golden hour and you want everything to go nice and neutral, uh, sorry, you want everything to go nice and warm. The last thing you want to do is get your color checker to, to well, I guess, normalize everything back to what standard 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin would have been. But in the case that we want to match all of this stuff in future in Capture One and be able to reference it, so you know this camera in this light, in this condition, what we need to do is get this file that's been taken, and whether it's got a model in front of it or not doesn't make any difference, or behind it or not doesn't make any difference. But we need to get this file into x -Rite software, and there are other pieces of software that do this. And we need to get it in there as neutral as possible. And here's the problem. When you load in your file into Capture One, you're not looking at a neutral file. First off, it's already applied an ICC profile for your camera. And there are lots of different ones. And let's, let's be honest, these colors are changing wildly between these ICC profiles that are loaded in when it comes in. So the pro standard one is Capture One's version of an ICC profile that is as accurate as they believe it can be under standard conditions. But it has, whether we like it or not, it has manipulated the color in the raw data. And we can see that it's done that because we can manipulate it further by choosing a different ICC profile. And it's this profile we want to get back from the color checker software. So first off, if we are going to export this into a color checker, and in fact, I'm just going to create a floating tool so you can see it, base characteristics. So we are going to change this Nikon Z7 II Pro Standard away from that and go down here to effects. This is really important. It's in there. If you don't see these other ones, you've probably got show recommended tick. So it looks like this. Change that to say show all. Go down here, go to effects, and go to no color correction. So in other words, tell Capture One, don't do anything. Just leave it alone. Just leave that file as it was in the raw data. Great. Next, curve, auto. We know, well, those of you that have been here a while... <laughs> We know that unfortunately auto, or well, fortunately slash unfortunately, depending on which way you come at it, puts in an S curve. So it makes the highlights brighter, the shadows darker. It gives us contrast. It gives us that punch that we like in pictures. Change this to linear response. Now, let me just show you something. I'm just going to clone this variant and put this one back to the Nikon Pro Standard and auto. Right. This is the raw in quotes, file that came from this camera. This is the uncorrected raw data that came from the camera. And still, it's not raw, raw, raw. It's still being translated to a certain extent. But this is what happens when you have an un... 
changed by ICC and unaltered by curve image. And these colors are the flat colors that Capture One, sorry, that your camera actually saw. And this is how you get Capture One to see it. So don't start calibration from this, start it from this. When you've done that, go to your export. Export it as a TIFF. TIFF, 16-bit, uncompressed. Now here's the next bit, ICC profile. Most people have got probably Adobe RGB 1998 embedded into there. Don't do that. We've just told Capture One that we want to apply no color correction and linear response curve in there. So to comply with that on our export thing, we go to embed camera profile. Export that image as a TIFF. That then, and this is the bit I can't show you, but you would take that into your color check software. You would then take the, I think there's a tool in there where you can map out the, uh, the overlay of what the colors should be, what the colors aren't. And that's when the software, your calibration software then takes over. And what it does is it matches, let's go back to it, this list by coordinate, and it says, well, C1 should be 8.13, 0 0.15, minus 0 0.76. So what do we need to do to make it that? And it will tweak all of those colors, and it reads out from that an ICC profile. You export the ICC profile from that piece of software. You need to restart Capture One. When you restart it, in here, in this list, at the bottom under Other, um, and let's just put a floating tool so you can see that as well. Uh, I don't know if you're going to fit on the screen. Let's see. Yeah, under Other, you will find the one that you created and saved from your calibrated image. Now, this is why it's really important what I said earlier. That's a calibrated image for this camera in this lighting setup. It will change if you're in different lighting setups. So I don't expect that you would have one standard ICC based on a color checker. You're probably going to have several of them. If you run a studio and it's the same every time, then potentially, yes, you could use the same ICC if you know that the, the temperature of light's the same and the distance and whatever is, is not going to cause an issue and you don't have daylight interfering on different times of year and different times of day. All of those things are a factor in how those colors look. So if you can control it, and if you're in the same place, you can get away with one profile. If you can't, that's why you've bought one of these. So the color checkers are designed that when you start your shoot, you take a picture of it. Normally, the model is holding it, or you know, in the case of a car, you put it on the... Um, a lot of people rest it on the car if you're allowed. Sometimes you get told off. Um, but in a, you know, a product shot in front of the product, in a um, landscape shot, you can do this. Um, then you know the point that you're focusing but bear in mind in a landscape typically we want to get the ambient color we want to alter these colors based on what the light around us is doing so i'm not too sure of the benefit of doing the camera calibration um, with an icc profile in a landscape because well it's our interpretation anyway but that's what you need to do to get your color checker data in here is an ICC profile, and then what you will find is those values for these cells match the values that the producer of your swatch has given you, whoever that producer seems to be. Uh, Alan, would you do a different profile for different lenses if the lighting was unchanged? Um, if I'm a lens manufacturer, no, obviously, because my lenses are perfect and they never, ever create any form of cast or change to the color values that come through um, those pieces of glass. You can probably tell <laughs> from uh, the way that I delivered that lenses aren't perfect. Um, and despite what a manufacturer will say, yes, there is potentially difference in how a lens allows the sensor to render what's in front of it. Um, I've seen some lenses with huge casts um, on them and it affects colors in different ways. So you know, would I do it with a different lens? If if you know that your lenses are round and about very, very similar, you know, if they're all branded lenses, they're all the same series, arguably not. Um, it depends how particular you're going to be. If you want those values to be spot on, then arguably, if you change something, you recalibrate. Um, and this is where, again, it comes down to your own personal preference, how far you want to go with this. Some people will recalibrate every single shot. 
um, if they move a flash around, if they move some ambient lighting around, if you change the color, change you know the that background color there is changing the overall color in this room that I'm in right now. If I change that to red, then the tones on everything else is going to change. So. If I change something major, I would probably reconsider uh, or consider doing a, a redo of the ICC. If it's not major um, and it's just, you know, I've changed the lens, I've stepped back a bit, whatever, any of those sort of things, I, I would be okay, I think, within a margin of error um, to stay with it. But that's why you use these things. Um, this is not the same as monitor calibration, you know, where you get the little sucker thing and, and put it onto the monitor that reads... Um, what's uh, what's coming out of your display and the whole end-to-end -end process if you so think about this what i've just described is just about getting the right colors into capture one from what you captured then we've got to worry about capture one displaying them correctly on your monitor which is another calibration exercise then we've got to worry about exporting that um, correctly onto the right format of file then we've got to worry about getting your printer to interpret that format and, and actually output exactly what was there in the first place. And at any point in that chain, things can go a little bit out. Um, but there's a general rule, which is good data in is good data out. So it's very difficult. And I, I, I do challenge this sometimes, especially with landscape shooters, I have to say. Um, we're so picky about getting colors right on the print output but we don't care about the input because we're not doing this um and there is an argument there that says you know if you know what your printer is doing you know that the screen is matching what your print output is what's on your screen is up to you you know if you felt that that scene was warmer or cooler or whatever else then then play with it you don't have to worry about this upfront step this is the purest, ab you know, absolutely correct process to get color right all the way through. But just bear in mind, it's designed to make sure not that the scene looks correct. It's made or making sure that that cyan is perfect cyan, that that magenta is perfect magenta. And if I'm shooting at blue hour, it's not. If I'm shooting at golden hour, it's not. If I'm shooting at midday, it's not. Shooting under artificial light, it's not. So decide whether you're happy with the changes in the input and then decide whether or not you need to do the uh, do this stuff. Um, <laughs> Jim, and, yeah, and then you upload it to Facebook and it crushes it anyway. So what, yeah, what was the point? I think, and I think there is a difference. When you're talking about print and we're talking about high-end print and large format and, and high-detailed stuff that is calibrated, then absolutely, and, and to Carsten's point, you know, if you start with calibration, then you'll always have it perfect. Yeah. So if, if you if you keep it calibrated all the way through the process, your chances of getting the right output that's matching what you saw is much, much greater. But if if you're gonna put this stuff, oh sorry, got the wrong comment there, to Jim's point. If you're gonna put this stuff um up onto social media or you know, web and whatever and compress it, you know, oh, I'd, if that's your only output, I'd really question why you're tying yourself in knots over uh the minutest detail of, you know, 0.1 um, or, or one uh, out of two five five out on a red channel or something like that. Uh, what was Chili's comment there? Sorry, uh, I wanted to do the master class. I happened right in the middle of my morning when my day job has my attention. Seems it would lose a bit of value if I couldn't ask questions. Uh, I don't know actually, to be honest. Um, so I know some people have, have watched the rerun stuff. Um, and I've got a lot out of it. Um, we we in the masterclass stuff we tend to follow a certain process, and actually a lot of it is coming from the workshop stuff that we we teach. So there's there's a set amount of of information that we'll try and give to everyone, um, which is hopefully useful across the board. Um, but yeah, so next time the answer is clearly you need to not be in a day job. You need to come along to the golden hour one live, and then we can ask lots of questions. <laughs> right, um, but. The biggest lesson we're going to get out of this is this is the first and last time that I'm going to talk about a picture that came from someone that did not provide their name. So please, when you upload photos, give us your name so that we know who to credit stuff to. Right. Chris, um, do you know what? When I, when I saw this picture, man, you get 10 out of 10 for effort, honestly. Um, oh. Wow. So for those of you that don't know what this, what's special about this picture and what Chris has done, 
I'm going to create a new variant of it right now. There's the original. Now, not only is it obviously a little darker, and it's had some tweaks done to it, but it was shot behind a gate or grill or fencing or whatever else. And Chris has manually cleaned that up. Um, so we go from here, where we've got, you know, relatively um, clear two lines there, um, to there, where it's a little bit cleaned up. But also we've got this one here, where a lot of work has gone in. Um, so... <sighs> So first off, you get effort points, genuinely, because this is the mask that was drawn. Um, if I turn that layer off, you can see the uh, the gate in there. Um, and here was the original gate. Now, what you're not going to be able to fix, and, and, and what Chris has done is he's done it through dodging. Um, he could be she. Um, sorry, whichever, whichever Chris. Um, but there's a dodging element in there, um, which is brightening the two strands or the two areas that were behind the gate. Now, the challenge with that is it's not going to fix seeing detail. So just to show you what I mean by that, there is, let's just whack up the exposure a little bit so we can see. Let's zoom out to here. So what we get through the gate in fact, I'm going to go a little unfair. I'm going to go a lot further in. If we look at this bit here, so this uh, this concrete bit here, and I'm, as you can see, I'm at 300%, so I'm being unfair on the picture. You're probably not going to see to this level um, when you zoom out or, or see it on a wall. But look at how sharp this detail is in here compared to where it is here. Now, yes, there is a darkening effect that happens with those bars or grills. But also what you're seeing, the reason you're seeing them slightly blurry is because obviously they're out of focus. They're in the bokeh. And effectively, you've got light traveling around those those uh, those bars and the camera through its lens is able to see sort of around it. Because remember, the lens is sort of seeing through this um, converging and then diverging pattern um, as it comes through the, the barrel. So it's able to kind of see through slash round bits to an extent, and the closer they are, and the same happens with our eyes. So if I hold my, my finger there, I can still see all the way through. But I do see sort of the outline of my finger. And in this case here, you do still have the fact that there is some of the picture that is obscured. So it's not quite as sharp, not quite as detailed as it would be without that gate or grill in place. So dodging and burning can help with that, but it's not going to fix it all. The, for those wanting the quick answer to this, what Chris has done, I would say, is the right move, and I think it's a very good job of, of doing it too. I am going to make a small change to one thing, um, but nothing major on here. I'm going to explain, though, as well, just as a... Let me just make sure this is flagged as a one that I'm editing. I'm going to explain why other methods wouldn't work. So let's imagine here we are trying to get rid of this darkened area here. So arguably, I could clone, right? Or I could uh, heal. But here's the problem. The way that Capture One's clone and heal work are it's looking for an area, wherever I tell it, to then either replace, in the case of clone, or merge, in the case of heal, with what's underneath. Now... That works fine if there's a pattern. So, you know, we've done demos of this before where there's a brick wall and you've got re or repetition or, um, you know, corrugated iron um, covering or, or cladding or whatever. All of that stuff, great, because I can take a repeated area here and I can, I can picture it over here and then just transplant um, across. But look, we've got these things at a converging angle, so the trains are getting nearer as they get further away, or closer in, in perspective terms. And they're at an angle as we look at them here, so they're going off to the side, and they change in um, thickness as a result of that perspective. So if I start copying here and start pasting it here, so clone tool, these ribs here are going to be a lot wider than they are at this point here. So that's not going to work, and we can prove it. So if I go to my clone stamp tool, and let's say well, we're going to take this bit here. Oh, sorry, no, let's take it from front to back first. So from there, and we're going to go to 100% opacity, 100% flow, and I'm going to start painting here. 
So it sort of fixed the lighting, so it's getting it back to bright again. But look, my rail has started to mismatch. It's misaligning with this rail. And the reason is because back here, they're closer together. Here, they're further apart. So as I just copy, literally copy to paste, it's not gonna, um, it's not gonna line up. So what about if I took it from here over to here? Well, kind of the same problem, but for a different reason. Because it's moving away from us in perspective terms, the angle changes of these ribs. So if I take it from here, great, and we can just paste it here. Well, now that really doesn't work because that angle really is wrong. So geometrically, this is an impossible one to use the clone stamp tool. And actually, to a certain extent, um, even if I went with the healing brush and said, let's go from there to there, it's still trying to heal the wrong angle. So when I let go of my mouse and let it do its clever stuff, it's going to match the color, but it's not going to match the lines. If I go front to back, so from there to there, in theory, all good, but in practice, ignore that bit at the back, but in practice, look at the thickness of these ribs compared to the thickness of the ribs underneath them, ignoring the fact that I... Uh, I screwed up that back bit. Um, but these ribs don't align because they've got smaller as they got further away and bigger as they get closer to us. So I've got no way of using heal or clone in this scenario to do it. Arguably a content aware fill in a pixel editor. So Affinity, Photoshop, whatever your choice is. Um, one of those fill tools would help with this. But man, we're asking it to think of a lot of stuff. I mean, when I get up to here, you know, how is it going to know which bits it should keep and the fact that we want to get rid of the dark stuff and, and leave the bits that weren't in the gate? It can't know that. Um, I did try it just for fun earlier, um, and it does a disastrous job. So assuming that we can't get any more detail back or any more content back, we then just look at the light. Now, in Chris's example here, if I turn on our mask for our our dodge in here, it only needed a 0.2 amount of dodge um, just to lighten this up. But my challenge with it is when I go to here. Because while this has been done very selectively, it's taken a lot of time by the look of it, there's, there's a bit of um, feathering and refine edge in there as well. Um, to me, it doesn't quite make sense that it's selective because if it's a bar, in front of the camera the the bar doesn't go you know let me just go back again too so display grayscale mask very handy the bar doesn't go on off on off it's not a morse code bar it's a solid bar that's going down in front of the camera so while it may be that we're less or we're, we're noticing the fact that it's darker here less there's no reason why that area shouldn't have been dodged as well as the areas that were more obvious so to me i think i would be probably putting on a solid um, line down there instead. So under my mask, I'm going to erase. I'm going to leave the dodge value in there. Uh, let's just, I could just clear the mask. It's a bit quicker. <laughs> so I'm now going to use my brush and we're going to make the brush feel, there's a bit of guesswork in here, but feel about the width of these uh, these bars. If you want a, a better way of seeing that the bar um, itself, let's create a filled thing. Um, bar clarity. Because I want to be able to see those bar lines a bit clearer. We're going to do that with our contrast right the way up. Lower some exposure a little bit. Um, yeah, that'll probably do us. We could go into clarity, but it's not really going to do much. It's just going to um, make it a bit more harsh, but I just need to see the width of this bar. And what I'm looking at is, can I make, and you can see there's quite a hard fall off on this, so can I make a brush feel like it's matching that bar? So it needs to be a little bit smaller, so the solid bit is there, a bit more about there, and then we've got a bit of a soft fall off, so it sort of goes out maybe to there, and you can see what I'm trying to do. So as I move in here, Look at my brush, and I'm looking at the middle part of the brush should be in the solid part of this line, and the outer part should be where the line completely disappears. 
So I think we're probably not far off. I can make it a little smaller there. We'll try with that. Now, these bars, in theory, we'll, we'll see in a minute, but in theory, are straight lines. So while they, they converge, they're still straight. So let's draw one of our little uh, lumps here. I'm just going to actually soften that edge a little bit more to so allow it to, to spread a bit more. So we're going to start here. Click once. Don't draw. You can't draw a straight line, trust me. It's almost impossible for anyone to. I'm sure there's one person that will claim they can, um, but it is difficult. So click once, hold down the shift key, go down to the bottom here, and we're going to click again. And if I turn the master, <laughs> I did a fill bomb on the wrong layer. Who didn't spot that? Uh, let's just, <laughs> let's go back to our dodge layer. Right, so we're going to click once up here. Should have had my mouse turned on. There we go, lesson. Press M to see your mask at all times. Click once. There's my dot. Move down here to where I want the N to be. Hold down the shift key and click again. And I'll get my straight line. Now in a minute we can feather it a bit as well and we'll have a play with that. So again, same on this side. So we're going to click once up here. Move down here and we're going to click again. Now, if that, and you can see there's bits of it creeping out to the side. Now, remember, we've got that clarity um, layer on that's making it worse than it appears. But you can see it sort of, it bleeds out further than the mask, maybe. So if even if I go into grayscale, the mask might need to be a bit softer at the edges. And that's fine. Right click, and we can either feather it or we can refine it. So I'm going to go to feather. And we've got here our feather control. So we can choose how much extra feathering, so on top of the hardness of that brush, how much extra feathering to pull on. And I'm going to go to about there. So pretty big. And apply that. Okay. Now I'll turn off that uh, clarity layer, and I'll turn off my mask. And we can see this is probably a little too much. Now that point 0.2 is maybe a little hot. So I'm just going to pull this down a touch, and we get to there. Now... To some people, that's not better. So to some people, they prefer this version. It depends on where you want the, the smudgy marks to be, I guess. Some people, this one. If this one is still too obvious where we've gone over it, well, remember, we can right-click, we can go to Feather, and we can Feather again. So we can keep feathering those two bars out until we find a reason. So here, look, not enough. Here it starts to blend a bit better. That's looking quite nice there. And apply that. So my actual mask is actually really, really feathered. If I go into our grayscale mask, well, you know, there's quite a blend there, but this is probably what the camera sort of saw. And here's my challenge with the, the way of doing it selectively. Yes, you can blend in, but the camera did see two solid lines. So even though we're saying on the selective thing, it didn't really affect, for instance, this ventilator here. Well, it did darken it, and we can see in Chris's original one, there's still dark stuff here, whereas in here, you know, we've got this shininess here matches that. So it's about blending it, but keeping it consistent to what the camera actually saw. We're trying to fix a solid object, so it makes more sense that we're fixing it with a solid approach, and then blend in the, end, or the edges. So if you've still got some edges that don't quite work, then blend them a bit more, you know, and maybe add a bit, a bit of extra mask on there. It may make sense to use the mask at 50%, for example, and then that allows you to add a bit more or subtract a little bit from that 50% mark. Because in here, at 100%, all I can do is effectively create another layer on top and add a bit more. But overall, you know, if I push that a little bit, I can use a little bit of brightness as well, which will flatten down, not just exposure. Let's go to there. You know, there's Chris's attempt there. It's a very good attempt. And just to remind you, to remind everyone, this is where it started. So to go from there to there by hand, huge amount of effort, really well done. I'm just looking up here, for example, and saying, well, if I used a solid line, and again, the, the challenge with this is once you've seen the bars, you won't unsee them. Close your eyes, or actually collectively, we're all going to do this. Look away from the screen. Now look back. And you won't see those bars. Um, so, A, you're always going to see them to a certain extent. But B, um, 
remember that you're not the one that's always going to be looking at this picture. So to someone that doesn't know the bars are there, don't worry about it as much as you think you need to. Now, there are a couple things. So, for instance, up here, that bar has lifted the shadows a bit too much. So we've got some choices we can use on the bar, um, the, the dodge layer. We can use a bit of shadow control, but that's going to affect more than just um, that in the picture. We could use the black control, which will affect mostly the dark areas. But again, we're risking bringing the bars back. Or in select cases, and this is kind of where it goes the opposite way to Chris's approach. In select cases, we then just erase. So we go into our eraser tool here, and I would recommend starting it at probably sort of half opacity. Go into our eraser, and we just pull down the amount of impact that layer is having on these areas that need to remain shadows. And again, over here. So in these two areas, we don't need that lift. That's looking a lot better. You know, down here, there's a question, do we need it or not? Maybe this down here should stay as a bit more of a shadow, this grill, because it should really match the one that wasn't under the bar. So let's go to our eraser, and I'm going to actually reduce it even further, so down to sort of 30%. Do one pass, maybe another. Um, and then you're in a good place. So that's one way. Um, it absolutely will work, but it's just a way of, if you look at the different approaches, it's just a way of removing certain parts of those solid bits. Not because they weren't there, the bar was still there. It's just that, unfortunately, by lifting up the shadows, we've lifted it too much with that dodge. The other way, Paul has beat me to it, you could clone the bar layer, or, or you don't even actually, actually have to clone it, you could just do it with the bar layer, but we take the bar layer and we run a luma range on it and we say we only want the bar to affect the bright parts of the image and not the dark bits well that would work too in fact we can double down on this so let's do both uh so i don't want it to affect i don't want it to lift the darkness in the windows and so on go to apply and we get a pretty clean image so you know I can still see some of the bar here in Chris's version. I see less of it here. I see other issues that if I didn't, you know, if I, if I looked at it purely and didn't do the look away and look back, I would notice them. But if I were able to just walk into a room and see this picture, I would not know that that was the original with those two in there. General rule, though, don't try and re or replicate or replace detail. If the detail is gone, it, it's gone. It was behind some bars and try and fix solid objects with solid solutions. Um, the second you start hand drawing, you know, if you've got a solid line that's in your shot, um, I've, done this with a, I've done this with a telegraph pole. Um, recently I did it, I, I was trying to draw <laughs> for the exact shape of a telegraph pole and forgot that, well, it's, it's straight, and it was, it was literally straight. Um, so A, I can try magic brush. B, if I did want to actually draw it, use the shift key on your keyboard. Um, it's one of the most powerful bar, or powerful keys on your keyboard when you're drawing brushes, and people don't even know it exists. So if I turn the mask on and go to my brush, standard brush, um, let's just put the hardness up and size down. If I draw, great, I can draw curves. But if I want to draw a straight line, click once, hold the shift key, click there. And I don't have to just do straight lines. So if I draw a curve like that, let go, hold the shift key, go over here, and there's my straight line. And actually, I could then fill it. So I can go to fill mask, and that will fill that in. So the shift key can be used at any point in mask drawing, and it's a really powerful way of controlling straight lines. Please don't be one of those people that struggles and struggles and struggles to draw a straight line in Capture One. You don't need to. There's a button that does that on the keyboard and it will really help. Okay, so that's Chris's um, railway shot, New York. Um, really nice. But as I say, 10 out of 10 for effort for the, for the first pass. I think there's probably a slightly easier way of doing it with a bit more control, um, which is that way. But it's the thought process is exactly right. Using the, the dodge button to do it is, uh, is a great move. Okay, so let's have a look at Jeff's shot. So 
Jeff, Jeff sent a note with this saying he shot it before the City Masterclass. Um, so, sorry. Um, but hopefully now, Jeff, you know some of the things that we could do um, slightly differently with this. But as a bridge shot, kind of cool. Uh, let's clone that variant. So let's just see the entire shot. So what Jeff's done is remove the boardwalk down here. Um, really just focused up on the bridge here. You've still got a bit of boardwalk down there. Um, you know, choices, isn't it? Um, it's whether people want to leave the boardwalk in or, or not. Personally, I don't actually find an issue with having some of that boardwalk in there. I, this bucket thing or the, the flower pot thing is a little bit distracting. But, you know, having a bit of an angle on here... I, I don't think this is a bad foreground to have a little bit of diagonal on there. We know it's a perspective um, shot anyway, so we're not we're not hiding anything. Um, <laughs> a ruler placing a whack on helps too. Yes. Um, so in fairness, absolutely right. If you're using a stylus, so a, a, a tablet stylus, you can place a ruler um, and guess in virtual space where the ruler needs to end, and then you can draw along it. But I'd still say a shift key is probably a bit more intuitive. <laughs> Right, so the, the edit itself, let's just go uh, before and after, so from there to there, so really good job of, of shadow recovery, nice color, color toning in there, I think there's a little bit of pinkiness in here which we can probably work on, um, but overall, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a decent recovery job in terms of the lighting that was in there. Um, so that's our clone, so this is the one that we're actually going to work on. Now, we've got on there a grad filter on the bottom that's been added. So Jeff's already put in a filter to effectively distract from the, the foreground. Now, one thing I do want to cover is cropping, actually, when we're looking at that. Recently, I've seen this, this tendency of people. Uh, let me just go to our crop tool. Uh, no, let me just show you something first. So let's say I want to affect uh, the very bottom water bit down here. So I'm going to create a new layer. Uh, really, really soft brush. Nice big size. Low opacity. And I'm going to just have a little bit of a, you know, bit of a fade out there, specifically there. Obviously, you would probably use a grad filter, but I'm just demonstrating that for one of the reasons that you'll see in a minute. So let's pull down our brightness there. So great, I've got a nice fall off near the edge of the frame and that's looking pretty good. And then I decide that I don't like this crop. I actually do want to include some of the boardwalk. So let's pull that down. Great. But now I've got a boardwalk that's getting lighter. And the reason is because this thing here was only drawn on the bottom part. Now, if I want to try and blend into that, it's really difficult, especially if this was drawn at, say, 50%. So if I do another 50% on top, the bits that didn't have any are going to get to 50, but the bits that already had 50% to a differing amount, based on how soft the edge is, are going to get 60, 70, 80, even 100% um, of paint. So, you know, be really careful with drawing masks after a crop and think about is there a chance that i might want to use a wider version of this shot if there is a chance of you doing that and thinking back and thinking going you know actually i do want a vertical version of it or i do want a, a, a long panorama please do your edits on the full shot don't edit after the crop edit before the crop and then do your crops as output it will make a big difference. The one time, I'll tell you, the first time it happens, you'll, ne you'll never do it again. But you'll get a call from someone saying, I love this picture. I want to buy your picture. Great, we want to license it. Wonderful. Um, here's a licensing agreement. Yeah, no problem. It's just we need the vertical version of it. Ah, all my adjustments stop at the edge of the crop. So be very careful with it. If you're unsure of the outcome or output from an image, do the edits wide and then crop down. Uh, ben, what about gradient mask if you change the crop? A gradient mask, and this is why I was saying you would typically do this with a grad, so it's less of an issue. But a gradient mask, you can save yourself ish. And I'll show you why there's an ish. Uh, let me give you an example by cloning here. I'm going to use a gradient mask on a new layer. And we're going to go to there, just for the sake of it. Um, let's change the white balance. Great. Now, let's make our crop 
bigger. The gradient mask will go off to the edge of the photograph regardless, so it doesn't care where you crop on a gradient mask. And as long as you don't change it from a gradient mask, you don't rasterize it, I can move it after that crop. So we can then say, actually, I want it to be following this line here for the boardwalk. Okay, great. But here's where it goes wrong. So let me just undo a few steps. So here's my crop. Great. And I'm now going to go into a Luma range, let's say. And I'm going to exclude certain parts, but keep others. Great. And apply that. And now, because I want to delete something, I'm going to go to my eraser and delete. And it says, an, an innocuous question. Would you like to rasterize the mask? Yes, I would, because I want to delete some stuff. So I've now deleted some stuff over there. Let's just put that up there. Good. So my mask now is looking pretty neat. Now I go to expand my crop. And now I want to turn that gradient. Only I can't because the gradient is no longer a gradient. It's been rasterized. So you've got to be really careful with gradient masks in that they remain changeable and they remain movable and they always go to the edge of the frame as long as they are a gradient mask. The second you rasterize them, start playing with ranges, start deleting parts with an eraser, start adding parts with a brush. The second you do any of that, when you go in to then put a new gradient mask in, you lose your previous one because the gradient mask takes over the layer. So it's just a case of have a, have a warning thing in your head that just says, am I sure I want to do this only on this little window or this crop of the wider picture? If I'm not sure, leave it alone. Um, just do it wide and then go in and crop later. So on the rest of this one, what I can see in here, um, if I go to the background layer where most of this work was done, so Jeff's actually pulled up shadows. You know, this is almost a full HDR shot. We'd normally tell you off over it, but it has worked pretty well on this. Um, if I look at the before and after, so the highlight recovery has done a good job, but be careful of this stuff here. A bit of a bit of a halo around there, a bit of an unnatural halo almost. I just want to check. Yeah, it is on Pro Standard. Interesting that. Um, so these these rings that that tend to follow the Pro Standard profile, um, they didn't used to be there um, so vividly when you were on a uh, on the original one, the generics. Um, but obviously on the Nikon Z, we don't have that um, that to go back to. But we have a ring um, around here, so be careful with that. Um, you know, don't uh, don't emphasize that more than we need to. And some of it is coming from the recovery of both white and highlights. If I were to back away the white recovery, it softens it a little bit. If I back away the highlight recovery, it softens it completely, but we don't get all the detail. For me personally, I think this is possibly too much recovery. We don't need it to be quite that detailed in there. So I would back away the white a little bit. If it's blown out, it's blown out. That's fine. It's a light. If we're looking at a street light and it's 255, that's okay. Um, highlight, I'd pull back a little bit. And you can see we're softening these edges here. We're getting them back to being a bit more of a glow um, rather than... You see how clear this is versus this one. It's, it's starting to... To, to give it a glow, give the light a bit of room to move and breathe and all that sort of stuff. So I'd back away the highlight recovery a touch. On shadow, well, we can do it through this huge shadow shift, but actually we can do it with just a brightness move as well. So if I pull the brightness up and keep an eye on the stuff that we've just backed away. So as I pull brightness up, I might want to recover highlights and whites a little bit more just to keep them balanced. But this could mean that I can back away that shadow recovery a little bit, and that helps with keeping it looking a bit more, a bit more urban rather than a, a drawing. Um, clarity and structure on here, I don't think there's any problem with those amounts um, on there. They've 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 worked out well. So the only challenge then is I get, um, you know, we've already got the bottom grad. We discussed that there. There's a healing layer to get rid of, I presume, some dust spots unless they were. Um, sorry, hotspots, unless they were stars. They're stars and hotspots, so we've got single pixels and stuff. Remember, you don't need... If it's if it's this stuff, yes, we need to heal it. But if it's purely this stuff, we don't need to heal that. We can go into our Details tab. 
under single pixel, we can slide this up to a value more than one, or one or more, and they go anyway. So if I go before, after, before, after. So if you get hot pixels uh, in a night scene specifically, you don't have to worry about using the healing brush. You can do it with this um, single pixel slider. And the bigger the dot, the bigger the hot pixel, the bigger the star you're trying to get rid of, the higher up the slider's got to go. In fact, this one's too obvious. It can't actually fix it even at 100. So I'd use it at a very, very low level to get rid of the simple ones, the, the, the small ones. Then, yeah, absolutely, put a healing layer on top. But, ah, Jeff's online. There we go. Forgot about single pixel. That's all right. So genuinely, single pixel, I, I forget about it every now and then um, too. Single pixel is there for where your camera's automatic um, hot pixel removal um, didn't work. So in an ideal world, after you shot this, the camera would have done a dark curtain and then applied that, that logic of the remaining pixels across to the final print or the final image, and then you'd have a roll with no hot pixels. If it's still got some left in it, or you didn't have that turned on, that's what single pixel noise reduction does. Um, but failing that, as you did, Jeff, again, 10 out of 10 for effort, you can do it manually and you can you can try and hit every dot out in the sky. Now, what I would do, though, is just create one final layer on here, um, which is going to be the sky. And I'm just going to follow the line of this bridge. And I just want to take this tint away from green, or sorry, away from green, away from pink a little bit. So where were we at before? It's just... We're at 7.8, and I'm just looking at this cloud um, where it's a little bit, you know, pink at sunset makes sense, pink at night, maybe not quite so much. Ooh, what's that? Got a weird computer thing. Um, so in terms of trying to get rid of that, all we're going to do is just shift that tint away from the pink and towards a more neutral, we're actually using green to do it, but a more neutral color. If you want the sky to go cooler, we could do, um, maybe down to there. That's about it. Be careful because we've used a gradient layer to do that. It's affecting everything, including these towers. So if we want to exclude those towers, remember you can use a Luma range and we can say display mask and take out. So we want all the shadow, but maybe we don't want those bright hot spots of the tower and its cables, but be careful of this cloud. So we want to go to there. Nice soft fall off so you don't notice it so much. And that's all. It's just a tiny little tweak to that sky. And it's just to neutralize this cloud. If you have a look here. So that's with, or with the, the pink side. That's when we neutralize it back down again. Just to get it in, uh, just to get back back a bit more, more I guess, white or, or gray, or grayscale. And, and if we look at it before, so here, you know, 53, 48, 66. So we're very much, you know, red and blue together. We're into that sort of pinky color here um, when i turn this on we get to 50 49 68 so that red and green difference has been almost more synchronized or, or, or more linked so we're, we're literally looking at the blue hour the blue in the sky rather than a bit of a tint um, towards that red away from green but that's it um other you know it's a nice shot works um but as you saw, <laughs> Jeff, last week, um, there may have been another way of shooting this, which which might have got you a very different outcome. But play with it. Um, you know, leaving the boardwalk in, I personally quite like having a bit of foreground in this sort of shot. Otherwise, it just feels like I've sort of got a, you know, a bridge out of nowhere. I don't know where I really am. And I want a bit more context to where this red thing is. Um, here gives me that. I would follow this line all the way down here, almost to the point where... It's as close as we can get to that flower pot coming into the frame. Um, so I have a starting line in this bottom corner and it coming up. But that's it. So those are our shots from today. So number one, um, color correction on the way into Capture One. That's how to do it. If you missed it, you just joined in, then go to the start. We covered a lot of this stuff in detail. Um, Chris's train, yeah, if you've got objects that you need to fix and they are solid objects, then use a solid fix um, in general, unless you're trying to do the blending bits, which you do afterwards. And then Jeff's bridge shot, um, again, lots and lots of different ways of shooting this stuff, but just be careful. You don't have to recover every single highlight. Sometimes it's okay if you've got bright lights in a city. That's what makes a city at night come to life. It's the bright lights. 
So, you know, let them blow a little bit. You know, if a, if a bright light that's looking straight at you is 255, let's just zoom in into here. Look at my value up there. 255, 255, 255. Oh, no, it's overblown. It's it's overexposed. Well, yeah, because it was a light that was looking straight at you in the camera. And if you were doing that to your eyes, that would hurt too. So that's us for uh, this time. Uh, we, as I say, we're going to be doing editing again. So it'll be in, well, it'll be next month's editing session. Um, between now and then, you've got the option of going to the Night Cityscape Masterclass. You've got the option of going live to the Golden Hour Landscape stuff. And remember, you've also got next week, um, myself and David Grover, all of your screens to as much or as little as you want um, as we hunker out, <laughs> hunker down around Iceland. Um, in between now and then, so any announcement stuff on dates or, or courses and stuff like that will be on the Facebook group. So go on to Facebook, search for Pori for Live, you'll find that, all good. Um, between now and the next session, please upload your photos. It's great seeing new stuff. So poriforlive.wetransfer.com, but make sure you include your name, no name. We will not do that again. Um, so we won't be editing pictures without someone's name. Uh, it just feels wrong mostly, but it's, there's also some um, reasons for it too. And then all of that said, if you need to get in touch, that's how to get in touch with us between now and the next time we see you. But between now and then, Look after yourselves. Uh, if you're in the UK, then enjoy your really long weekend. And we'll see you later on. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.